Welcome. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's field hearing in Charleston, West Virginia at the University of Charleston. At today's field hearing, you will hear from Director Richard Cordray and a panel of distinguished experts who will discuss issues related to developments, risks, and benefits of using alternative sources of, of financial information developed through new technologies to weigh a consumer's credit worthiness. Today, the Bureau issued a request for information about this issue. With this RFI, the Bureau is seeking comments from the public on whether unconventional sources of information, new ways to analyze the data, and the use of new technologies could open up more access to credit for many Americans who are currently outside the mainstream credit system. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB, is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. As part of the Bureau's mission to protect consumers, to date, we have handled over 1 million complaints and actions, resulting in nearly 12 billion in relief to over 27 million consumers. My name is Zixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB. Our audience today includes consumer advocates, industry representatives, state and local officials, and of course, consumers. We're delighted that you're here. We're also grateful that the Honorable Patrick Morrissey, Attorney General for West Virginia, is here with us today and will provide remarks. We're also grateful that several members of the West Virginia State Legislature have joined us at today's field hearing. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you about what you can expect. First, you'll hear from the Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey, then from CFPB's Director, Richard Cordray, who will provide remarks about alternative data and the Bureau's RFI. Following the director's remarks, David Silberman, Deputy Director, Acting Deputy Director and the Associate Director for the Bureau's Research Markets and Regulations Division will frame a discussion with a panel of experts. After the discussion, there will be an opportunity to hear from members of the public. Today's field hearing is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov, and you can follow CFPB on Facebook and Twitter. So let's get started. Patrick Morrissey was elected as the Attorney General for the State of West Virginia on November 6, 2012, and re-elected to a second term November 8, 2016. Among the Attorney General's many impressive accomplishments over two terms, he secured a $160 million internet settlement in December of 2015, which marked the largest independently negotiated consumer protection settlement in West Virginia's history. He also strengthened the office's consumer protection division, enabling it to vigorously enforce the state's laws and proactively educate citizens about scams and ways to protect their identities. Attorney General Morrissey, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, and I'm grateful that everyone has come here today, and I'd like to do a special shout out to Director Cordray for coming in from Washington, D.C. I think the topic that you're going to hear about today is incredibly important because all of us in the state of West Virginia care very passionately about enhancing consumers' credit opportunities. And so I look forward to learning a little bit more about some of the alternative data and the innovative new ways that we can expand opportunities for West Virginians. So a hearty welcome to you, Director, for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. Now, as previously mentioned, my name is Patrick Morrissey. I'm the Attorney General of the great state of West Virginia, and it's a pleasure to welcome a number of you to our great state. Uh, 
I trust Director Cordray, because he's a neighbor from Ohio, is familiar with our state's uh, natural beauty. We have an incredible place, one of the most beautiful states uh, in the nation. Uh, I ask everyone who's coming in to come back. Ski our mountainsides, come to the summer, go to the New River Gorge, go down to Greenbrier County. You're not going to find a better place uh, to come back and visit. I'm also grateful for Director Cordray's uh, commitment to public service and a lot of the work he did in Ohio, in particular some of the $2 billion he secured for Ohio retirees. So uh, I know he's been very aggressive protecting consumers and I have a lot of respect for that. I also know that uh, there are times that we might have different views on the roles of government and the role of the CFPB. It's probably no secret that West Virginia was part of a collection of states that filed suit over the CFPB because we had a number of significant legal questions, questions pertaining to how the agency was funded and the constitutionality of it. But despite you know, those differences, I can say that we share a common interest in protecting consumers, and that has to be all of our priority. I can say that our offices have worked together on a number of fronts. Together, we've monitored the conduct of banks in the wake of the National Mortgage Settlement from 2012. That settlement sought to remedy misconduct, predatory, predatory lending, servicing issues, and compliance failures. And we believe that that partnership has resulted in West Virginia consumers receiving at least $3 million in payment and mortgage modifications since 2014. Beyond that, our offices have actually worked together to successfully sue SunTrust Bank, HSBC, and Morgan Drexen, a company that provided outsourced administrative support services to attorneys and debt settlement practices. The SunTrust settlement, well, that provided more than $260,000 to West Virginia borrowers who loans were serviced by the bank. People who lost their homes to the terrible foreclosures that occurred in uh, 2008 through 2012. The HSBC settlement allowed more than 2,000 West Virginia consumers to receive payments or rate reductions, modifications, and some decrease on their loan. That was a good result for the consumers of our state. And like the National Mortgage Settlement, the SunTrust and HSBC lawsuits really sought to remedy that misconduct, that predatory um, loan behavior, and the servicing and compliance failures that we saw in place for a long period of time. So the object isn't just to secure money for the consumers, the object is to fix the problems so they don't occur again in the future. We look at the Morgan Drexen case. Uh, well, that focused on misrepresentations as to the provisions of legal services and debt settlement. I can tell you one of the issues we spend the most amount of time on from a consumer protection perspective is ensuring that our debt collection laws are upheld vigorously. Whether we're dealing with the issues pertaining to how the debt is collected so that there are reasonable tactics for collection or ensuring that the entities are licensed in the state of West Virginia before they collect the resources, we take our responsibility over that very, very seriously. We've also been pleased to work with CFPB on other issues of importance for the state, including the closure of ITT Technical Institute, which had provided courses to hundreds of West Virginians. And I think there are many other examples of how both agencies have worked to try to enforce the laws um, that we're responsible for. In my office, we try to attack every violation of the law aggressively. We don't care about political affiliation or economic status as we're enforcing the law. Our job is to make sure that consumers are protected. Since 2013, my office's Consumer Protection Division has brought in over $84 million through lawsuits, assurances of discontinuances, and has also secured almost $30 million in debt cancellation for consumers. It was also mentioned earlier, we were able to secure a separate $160 million settlement uh, from Frontier Communications over 10 million of which went to help consumers to address the issues that came from promises that weren't met. $150 million went back to invest to ensure that the internet speeds were going to be increased. Because once again, it's not enough to just collect a settlement. We actually have to change behavior and make sure that the underlying problems that gave rise to the consumer protection violations in the first place 
are addressed. That's part of our underlying philosophy within the West Virginia Attorney General's Office. Beyond the actual settlements, the lawsuits, and the investigations, we also spend a lot of time educating West Virginians on scams. Uh, every day, someone is being ripped off across the country and within the state of West Virginia. So we have consumer advocates that are spread out throughout the state, meeting with people, collecting consumer complaints, and most importantly, educating people about what's going on. I can tell you that consumer scams are a real problem because fraud is a very real problem. And I'll give you a personal experience that occurred just the other day. I was down in uh, Greenbrier County, and I was talking to an 86-year-old elderly woman. She was recently ripped off by the grandparent scam. And she talked through how the scammers called and they were able to reach out to her and how they set up this manipulative system in order to rip her off. Scams affect the elderly, but they also affect people regardless of demographics, regardless of age. All of us have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable and to ensure that people know more about these types of scams so they don't fall prey to it. It's easier than people think to fall victim to a scam, and I can personally attest to that. I can tell you about many people who have dealt with technology scams, especially in a state like West Virginia, when you're dealing with slower internet, when people say, does your computer have a virus? Does it have a problem? Would you mind if we access that because we can fix your problem? Those are issues that come up all the time, but then you're surrendering your precious personal identification away. We have to educate people, and that has to be done every single day by everyone here in this room. This is critical. So we're busy working on a lot of consumer protection issues, but I also want to mention another matter that I think is critical as consumer protection. While we have a great topic today in terms of alternative data, I want to emphasize that consumer protection matters also include fights on substance abuse. And we've worked very hard to educate people in West Virginia about the nature of this devastating problem in the state. West Virginia has the highest drug overdose death rate in the nation at 41 and a half people per 100,000. No office has done more to be more aggressive. We've been very holistic, going after it from a supply, a demand, and an educational perspective. And just recently, my office announced the largest pharmaceutical settlement ever in the history of the state, $36 million. It's my hope that a lot of that money can go to treatment and to address this terrible uh, problem. We have to hold everyone accountable within the pharmaceutical supply chain and change that problem. It's a real public health crisis, and I'm committed to continue working on that. In closing, every part of consumer protection demands our daily attention. And I look forward to working with all the relevant agencies, people within the state and in Washington, to make sure that we achieve our common goals of protecting consumers, going after consumer fraud, and respecting our boundaries, making sure that federal and state agencies comply with the Constitution and our laws. But Director Cordray, I'm particularly grateful that you're here today to grace your presence in our incredible state. Thank you and to your team for coming here today, and we'll look forward to hearing about this exciting new topic. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Morrissey, for the remarks and for the warm and gracious welcome. We, uh, it is reciprocated, and we look forward to working with you in the future. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's attorney general. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion from Ohio's retirees, for Ohio's retirees, <laughs> for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as an Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray.
Actually, Zixta, your, um, your uh, uh, unexpected and unusual stumble there reminded me of when my children came home from school. They were in elementary school at the time, and they had learned that day uh, that commas save lives. We could say prepositions save lives. They were talking about the difference between a T-shirt that said, let's eat, comma, grandma, as opposed to let's eat grandma. So uh, I also want to take a moment to really uh, thank uh, General Morrissey. He and I had a chance to talk a little bit ahead of time, and we share a common view that consumer protection is a form of law and order. Uh, and people who break promises to the citizens of this state or those of the United States or, or uh, know that there are laws in place and violate them in order to get an advantage or, or get money in their own pocket, uh, you know, those are people who, who need to be uh, uh, enforced against vigorously. Uh, we try to do that. The Consumer Bureau, uh, the West Virginia Attorney General's Office definitely tries to do that. And General Morrissey, I also appreciated your comments about opioids, although there are many issues that go well beyond what we do at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It's a reminder that the state attorneys general deal with the entire menu of public policy problems uh, in the states across the country, and we're happy to have the chance to work shoulder to shoulder on them in our particular uh, uh, area of consumer finance. So thank you all for, for joining us, and we're glad to be in Charleston as we explore some new frontiers for consumer access to credit. As many of you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is the single federal agency with the sole mission of protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. We're working to ensure that consumers can gain access to financial products and services that are fair, transparent, and competitive. In this spirit, we continue to encourage consumer-friendly innovation, such as through our Project Catalyst. So today we're announcing a request for information about unconventional sources of information, new ways to analyze this data, and how new technologies can help in assessing people's credit worthiness. We want to learn more about whether this kind of alternative data could open up greater access to credit for many Americans who are currently stranded outside the mainstream credit system. We also want to understand how market participants are or could be mitigating certain risks to consumers that may arise from these innovations. Let us begin by reviewing how our mainstream credit system generally works. Until the rise of the modern credit reporting industry, many loans were made based on personal relationships of long standing that developed between creditors and their customers. Someone who knows all about your personal financial story, including your way of making a living, your accumulated wealth, your spending habits, and your family background, has an excellent vantage point for deciding whether it's a good risk to extend credit to you. Based on everything they know about you, they can size up your credit worthiness, including any collateral you may be able to post to security. Thus, they can make a pretty careful determination as to whether you're likely to recover what they decide to lend to you. Although this framework still describes some fairly vigorous modes of local lending in this country, particularly at community banks or credit unions where it's quite successful, we've also developed another credit framework uh, in our society. It uses automated underwriting systems and is built on extensive data about people's credit histories and algorithms that are used to analyze that data. This newer approach reflects changes in our society such as increased mobility and the growth of national banks and monoline financial firms. These companies are not in the same position to know all the detailed history of local communities and individual customers at a personal level. This approach also reflects new technological capabilities that can mine huge mountains of data and determine mathematically which elements are most closely correlated with future performance. To get a loan under this more automated framework, a consumer typically needs to have a credit score. An individual credit score is fashioned from the information contained in individual files that are managed by nationwide credit reporting companies. They typically have files on 200 million Americans or more. Uh, this is the product of the modern era, now greatly bolstered by computerized databases. Each file, known as a credit report, tells the story of a consumer's credit history and current credit usage, at least what can be known from the information that's actually in the file. It records the size and type of loans made to the consumer, what is owed, how much credit is available, and whether prior debts were paid on time. It may list personal loans and car loans, credit card balances, student loans, and mortgages.
It may also note unpaid bills in debt collection and list court judgments, liens, or bankruptcies. This credit history is then used to determine how likely consumers are to repay existing debts and to gauge the prospects for repayment of any new debts they may take on. Some of the limitations of this system derive from historical and contingent circumstances. For example, consumers often try just as hard to make their monthly rent payments, I know I did when I was a renter, as they do their monthly mortgage payments. But rent is often omitted from credit files, unlike mortgage payments. This may be because rent is not typically viewed as credit, or it may be because mortgage loans are made by banks and financial companies that have mechanisms for keeping careful records of them, which results in more regular categories of reportable data. By contrast, rents are collected by millions of individual landlords scattered all over the country, and data on those payments is not collected in any systematic way. To take another example, debt collectors often report data on the debts they are collecting, including debts arising from unpaid medical bills, for example, but the billers themselves, such as medical providers, do not report such information. Credit files thus may include information about bills you failed to pay, but not necessarily about all the bills you did pay. In automated underwriting systems, and even in many manual underwriting systems, decisions to grant credit and set interest rates on loans are based on credit scores to a large degree. These familiar three-digit scores are drawn from the information contained in individual credit files. As such, credit scores play a central role in the financial lives of American consumers. They can determine whether people will be granted credit at all, the terms or conditions for doing so, including the interest rate. The availability of credit scores and the accuracy and completeness of the underlying data have thus become increasingly important to almost all Americans. Unfortunately, one of the reasons we're here today, for many consumers with a limited or non-existent credit history, a credit score is out of reach. The Consumer Bureau has run the numbers and estimates that 26 million Americans, 26 million, are credit invisible, meaning they have no credit history at all in these files. Under the most widely used scoring models, another 19 million people have credit histories that are too limited or have been inactive for too long to generate any credit score. Here in West Virginia, nearly 180,000 residents are credit invisible, and nearly 130,000 more residents have too little credit history or histories that are too inactive to have a credit score. Add it up, and about one in five adults here in the Mountain State are hampered in their financial lives by a lack of a credit score. The same story can be told virtually anywhere in the country, since 45 million adults, Americans, fall into these categories nationwide. People with little or no credit history or who lack a credit score have fewer opportunities to borrow money in order to build a future, and any credit that is available usually costs more. That only deepens their economic vulnerability. Among them are those living in lower income neighborhoods, young people just starting out in life, and many who are recently widowed or divorced and may not have yet built sufficient credit history on their own. Many people without credit records or credit scores work hard and strive to pay their bills on time. They may live paycheck to paycheck, straining to make ends meet. They often are caught in a catch-22, unable to get credit because they have not had credit before. They cannot seize meaningful opportunities, such as borrowing to start a business or buy a house. For these consumers, the use of unconventional sources of information, known as alternative data, may allow them to build a credit history and gain access to credit. Alternative data may draw from sources such as rent or utility payments. These obligations may not qualify under more traditional definitions of credit, and as a result would not be factored into the credit decisioning process. Alternative data may also draw from electronic transactions such as deposits, withdrawals, or transfers from a checking account. And it can encompass the kinds of information that relationship lenders typically know as a matter of course, such as the consumer's occupation, educational attainment, and various other personal accomplishments. New forms of alternative data may come from sources that never existed before, such as the way we use our mobile phones or the internet. By filling in more details of a consumer's financial life, this information may paint a broader and more accurate picture of their credit worthiness. Adding this kind of alternative data into the mix thus holds out the promise of opening up credit for millions of additional consumers. 
Alternative data holds out further promise as well. Credit scores, by their very nature, are backward-looking indicators. Consumers who experience a financial hardship, such as the loss of a job or a large medical expense, and many people experience such hardships, may fall behind in making credit payments. This may tag them with a low credit score long after their financial situation has turned around. Alternative data may help lenders identify more precisely from those who currently carry so-called subprime credit scores, a substantial subset of consumers who are, in fact, good credit risks. These people should not be held back simply by their retrospective credit score. The request for information we're issuing today looks into the pros and cons of these uses of unconventional sources of information. We're examining what data are already available for use today, and we're looking into what the future may hold as technologies continue to evolve. We're seeking to study how these data are being gathered and analyzed in underwriting models now used by banks and other financial companies, including the so-called fintech companies. And we're seeking to better understand how these models and modeling techniques are evolving. This request for information focuses on four main issues. First, it looks at the potential risks and benefits for consumers of using this additional information to better assess their likelihood of repaying a loan. Second, it looks at how introducing new alternative data sources into the credit decisioning process might add to its complexity. Among other things, we want to find out if this will make credit decisions more difficult for people to understand and thus make it harder for them to control their financial lives. Third, the request for information looks at how the use of interpretation of these data may affect privacy and transparency. And finally, it looks at whether reliance on some types of alternative data could result in discrimination, whether inadvertent or otherwise, against certain consumers. Let me start with the first point, access to credit. As I mentioned, a key question for the Consumer Bureau is how people without a credit score can begin building a credit history. We want to learn more about how we could promote the responsible use of alternative data, even as we continue to protect consumers' interests. For instance, someone with no credit history might nonetheless be quite reliable in paying their cell phone bill or their rent on time. Or they may have a history of checking account deposits and have made good use of a debit card. This might make them a very viable credit risk. We know that some lenders will not loan money to consumers with a credit score that is less than, say, 620, according to traditional measures. But they might do so if alternative data suggests that a particular consumer with such a score would be less likely to default on the loan as based on this other type of information. This leads us to the second issue. Even as alternative data may shed more light on a consumer's credit worthiness, the sheer volume of new data that may be streaming into the system could have other effects. On the one hand, new analytical methods based on unconventional information could produce a faster, less complicated application process with lower operating costs for lenders and thus lower loan costs for borrowers. On the other hand, the accumulation of more and more alternative data could create a tangle of information that is harder for people to understand and unravel. The credit process can already be somewhat murky, so we want to learn whether folding in alternative data could complicate the decisions facing consumers. The harder it is for consumers to understand their credit record or whether they're likely to qualify for certain loans, the harder it will be for them to master their finances. The same complexity could also burden lenders who must explain adverse credit decisions to consumers. And it may bog down financial educators and counselors who are trying to help people understand their credit standing and take more control of their financial lives. The third issue we're raising today concerns how alternative data is shared, by and to whom, and whether these interactions are safe and secure. We want to know whether this information is reliable and whether its use is transparent to consumers. Some consumers may not even know that the information was collected and shared, let alone how it may be used in the credit process. We're also exploring whether some information is more prone to errors because it was collected under weaker standards in place at the time. Another question is whether consumers can correct any mistakes that turn up. As part of our inquiry, we're looking into how the credit reporting laws may apply to these and other issues. And finally, we're looking into how this information, even if entirely accurate, may be applied or interpreted. If the use and analysis of alternative data leads to certain consumers being needlessly penalized, we want to know that. For example, some newer underwriting algorithms use measures of residential stability. These measures may help predict credit worthiness, they may well do so, and may identify consumers who make their rent, pay rent payments on time. 
yet members of the military, to take one example, are required to move frequently as their duty stations change. As a result, this particular measure could hinder access to credit for service members, even if they are in fact a good credit risk. Other data may be strongly correlated with characteristics such as race or gender, which could enable lenders to do indirectly what they're forbidden from doing directly, drawing conclusions about whether to make a loan based on a person's race, gender, or other prohibited categories. Similarly, data tied to a consumer's place in the economic ladder may hinder those trying to climb it. This may be especially true for those who are already struggling financially and facing a system that's full of obstacles. So we're looking into how fair lending laws might apply to these and other issues. As we consider how the risks of alternative data may give rise to the potential for discrimination, I want to pause for a moment and make clear our intentions with requests for information. The fair lending laws are designed to promote equal access to credit for all Americans without regard to race, sex, ethnic background, or a variety of other personal characteristics. The reason for these laws is to eliminate such credit discrimination in the financial marketplace. But if fair lending concerns cast a large enough shadow, they may prevent people from considering and using alternative data that might open up more credit for minority and underserved consumers. This could interfere with progress for the very people these laws are intended to protect. Equal access to credit means even more if overall access to credit is expanded and not constrained by lingering uncertainty about how regulators intend to apply fair lending laws. So we've crafted this request for information to help us better understand whether and how such uncertainty may be hindering credit access for disadvantaged populations. We also want to learn more about how the Consumer Bureau might reduce that uncertainty while holding fast to the anti-discrimination principles that are the cornerstones of federal law. That would help market participants go about their business with more confidence that they can better assess the creditworthiness of particular consumers without running afoul of legal requirements. In short, we see alternative data as holding out the promise to benefit the very populations that may be most disadvantaged by excessive reliance on traditional credit reports and credit scores. And we're committed to having a full and frank discussion about how we can minimize the risks and maximize the potential benefits. With the request for information that we're issuing today, the Consumer Bureau invites all who are interested in these developments to share their views on this rapidly evolving aspect of financial services. We strongly encourage affordable, responsible lending to more people who may be already deserving of the opportunities that credit can bring to their lives. At the same time, we want to make sure that all lenders are playing by the same rules. This even-handed oversight both protects consumers and ensures a level playing field for the financial industry. And it applies to both big banks and small startups. We want to learn more about how the use of this data affects consumers and how it's being analyzed and interpreted. And we want to know whether it can help more of our neighbors gain control of their financial decisions, enjoy more options, and achieve their own vision of the American dream. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray. At this time, I'd like to invite the panelists to take the stage. While they're doing so, I'll briefly introduce CFPB and guest panelists. David Silberman serves as the Bureau's Acting Deputy Director and Associate Director for the Bureau's Research, Markets, and Regulations Division. Gail Hillebrand serves as the Associate Director for the Bureau's Consumer Education and Engagement Division. Keo Chia serves as the Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office of Community Affairs. Our guest panelists are Chi Chi Wu, attorney with the National Consumer Law Center, Erin Riki, Principal of Upturn, Amanda Jackson, Organizing and Outreach Manager, Americans for Financial Reform, Michael Gardner, Senior Vice President of Specialized Services and Initiatives, Equifax, Nippin Goal, Senior Market and Portfolio Strategist with Cabbage. Francis Creighton, Executive Vice Pre President of Government Affairs Financial Services Roundtable. David, you have the floor. Thank you, Zixta. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Zixta has said, I'm David Silberman. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the CFPB and the Associate Director of the Bureau's Division of Research, Markets, and Regulations. And it's my pleasure to be with you to moderate this panel discussion portion of our hearing about the use of alternative data and modeling techniques in the credit process. 
As Ixt has indicated, we're going to hear today from a number of respected panelists, including consumer advocates and industry participants. Each panel member will give us some background and provide their perspective. We'll then pose questions to our panelists and engage in a discussion. And the panel discussion will then be followed by the public comments component of the hearing, where we'll hear from members of the public who have signed up to share their observations. As Director Cordray noted in his remarks, the Bureau estimates that approximately 26 million Americans have no traditional credit history and are considered credit invisible, and another 19 million Americans do not have sufficient or recent credit history to generate a credit score under commonly used scoring models. For these 45 million Americans, obtaining credit can be difficult, if not impossible. As Director Cordray has explained, the use of alternative data could expand access to credit for these consumers, but certain types of alternative data presents significant risks for consumers. So as you've heard, today the Bureau has published a request for information, or RFI, to seek information about the use of alternative data and modeling techniques in the credit process. The purpose of this RFI is to assist the Bureau and market participants in better understanding what's happening in the market and what issues are raised. We want to be able to assess whether there are steps the Bureau can and should take to facilitate practices that enable responsible innovations, allowing consumers to realize the benefits of alternative data, while providing necessary consumer protections and safeguards to mitigate any consumer risks. In the past 10 months, Bureau staff have been meeting with market participants, including incumbent financial institutions and fintech firms, with consumer advocates, with academics and with our sister agencies to understand the benefits and risks of various types of alternative data and modeling techniques. While we've learned much, there's still a great deal to be learned. Today's RFI and this field hearing are the next steps in the process as we move forward to seek to ensure that consumer benefits from the use of alternative data are realized and that risks are addressed. So with that in mind as a framing, I'd like to invite our panelists to present their opening remarks. Each panelist will have three minutes to make a brief statement. Following this, Gail, Kao, and I will moderate a discussion. So we'll start, we'll go down the line. We'll start with uh, Chi Chi Wu from the National Consumer Law Center. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David, um, for both the introduction and those remarks. Um, so alternative data, there's a lot of buzz about alternative data. That's why we're here, right? Um, it's seen by many as a potential solution for this issue of credit invisibility. Um, and for some, it's seen as a, a panacea. Um, for, for us, though, on the consumer advocacy side, um, it's definitely not a panacea. It could be a solution, but more, more likely it's a tool. And like any tool, it could be good, or it could be bad. It depends uh, from our perspective on what kind of data is being used and how that data is being used. Um, you know, for us, the devil's always in the detail. Details, and so you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of alternative data that have been bandied about. M more right now, the 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 more conventional alternative data. Uh, so, for example, um, Director Corje mentioned rental data. It seems from some of the pilot studies, rental data could be um, very promising, especially given that the rental data that's being added um, is predominantly positive data. The negative data is already in there in terms of there being collection items um, and new information, negative information in terms of late payments isn't being added. Um, so that's one that you know, seems to have promise. On the other hand, a type of data that we've been strongly opposed to using because we think it's potentially harmful is gas and electric utility data. Um, this is a, an industry that's very heavily regulated because it's a natural monopoly. Um, there are a lot of strong consumer protections and we think that monthly reporting of gas and electric utility data will undermine those protections. Plus, it's a, it's a payment obligation that really fluctuates greatly greatly. Um, you know, in the north during the winter you get high bills, in the south um, high bills during the summer, but then, you know, as the, the seasons roll along, um, it, the obligations drop. And so, um, you know, people struggle to pay their bills during high usage areas and it depends on the weather, which is, you know, one thing that consumers definitely can't control. Um, so that's one we have concerns about. 
Um, telecom, uh, cable and cell phone data, on the other hand, doesn't raise those same concerns because it's not as heavily regulated. Um, the issue uh, with that is we want to make sure that consumer, you know, that when that such data is used, consumers' rights to um, dispute errors or problems is properly protected because, you know, as folks know, people do have problems with their cell phone and cable companies every once in a while. Um, but there is potential there. Um, and then how it's used is also important. You know, we are more concerned about when a, a bunch of new data is dumped into the files of the big three credit reporting agencies um, because, you know, while there are maybe 50 million people who are credit invisible, there are 200 million who um, have existing files. And will that data help or hurt? Um, it, you know, for the credit invisibles, will it create um, a bad score. Um, you know, credit invisibility may be bad for credit purposes, but those cr big three files are often used for other purposes, such as employment and insurance, where invisibility isn't such a bad thing, where a, where a no hit is better than a bad score. So the, the way the data used is very important. Um, and then just a couple seconds on less conventional types of alternative data, you know, social media, uh, internet searches, um, things like that. Um, you know, those are, um, they have potential, but they also have risk. Um, most importantly, um, accuracy and predictiveness. Um, and, you know, how do you dispute whether your internet search result accuracy is being properly um, recorded? And, you know, whether, whether it's my searches on my laptop or my 14-year-old son's engaged in some interesting searches. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Aaron Ricci from Upturn. Hi there. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Bureau for holding this hearing and for looking at this issue and its past research on this issue. And I want to start, I am I think here partially to be the, the public interest computer nerd on the panel, um, but I want to start with what makes this interesting beyond the technology and beyond the data. And that's what Director Cordray mentioned in his remarks, that there's about 45 million people in this country that are currently underserved by this traditional system of credit reporting. And many of those people um, have various other vulnerabilities that contribute to their absence in the system. And so I just want to keep that as the starting touchstone and the touchstone we return to um, as we continue this discussion. Um, without access to credit, the, the, what, what's there is pretty ugly. Um, I did a report last fall where we looked at the sorts of um, search advertisements that came up when you searched for, um, I need money fast. Um, and it's, it's really not pretty. So I think that part of this is actually defending consumers against um, the really um, atrocious products that await them when they don't have other options. Um, I agree with everything that Chi-Chi just said in terms of data um, potentially being a tool that could be part of the answer in improving the situation. Um, I want to start with a broad theme, and I'll go into more details as the questions emerge throughout the hearing, um, which is that the goal here is not just to improve lenders and banks' ability to predict creditworthiness. That's certainly an important piece of the solution, and having some sort of good prediction is oftentimes better than having no prediction. But I think it's really important that we not lose sight of the fact that prediction is half of what we're looking for here, and the other half of what we're looking for here is fairness. We're not just looking at new big data sets to see what kind of combinations of things correlate with likelihood to repay versus likelihood not to, that's a starting place. But that we need to think carefully about whether or not the predictiveness and the correlations that we're seeing in the data are actually serving the people, the 45 million people, that we're setting out to help here. Um, we shouldn't allow protected class to sneak in somehow and be something that's driving predictions. Where you live shouldn't sneak in somehow and be driving predictions. Who your friends are shouldn't sneak in somehow and be driving predictions. Um, so we need to be really, really careful, especially as we grow the data sets, especially if we ever get to the point where we're thinking about something like social media data. We always need to ask, why is this driving predictions? And is this the kind of, is this the kind of score and the kind of data we want driving these decisions in our society? We don't want to get past the point where these decisions aren't explainable anymore. Um, I think murky is a great word for our current credit system. It's going to get harder the more data we add. And so I think we need to keep explainability um, both for consumers and for regulators um, in the puzzle here. Um, and finally, I think we need to look at the bigger questions of 
are we driving virtuous cycles rather than spirals down? Are the sorts of data we're adding in likely to elevate people, or are they, are they going to suffer from the same uh, issues of punishing people that fall in hard times? So I think that, again, the theme I just want to start with here, prediction is half of the equation, but we can't lose sight of asking, why is it predictive? Is it predictive in a way that we want our credit scores to be predictive? And is this actually going to lift up the people that we care about, that kind of core measure of success? Thank you. Amanda Jackson for Americans for Financial Reform. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, and hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for Americans for Financial Reform to join this important panel on the use of alternative data to help make credit scoring decisions. As you may know, Americans for Financial Reform is a project of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and continues to support and seek insight into data conversations. Alternative data is just part of the larger universe of big data. Of course, the credit bureaus, which collect, aggregate, and then sell credit reports based on billions of bits of information concerning whether and how millions of consumers pay their bills and whether they pay them on time, have been using big data for years. Credit scores, whether sold by the bureaus or others, are based on credit reports. But with the growing power of network computers and the ubiquitous data collection system that has grown up in the digital economy, more and more data are being collected and more and more algorithms are being proposed to aid in corporate decision making. Recognizing the importance of looking at big data through a civil rights and consumer protection lens, several years ago the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, leading members of Americans for Financial Reform, aided by the technologists here at Team Upturn, uh, work with a broad group of organizations to form a civil rights principles in the era that is big data. We aim to stop high-tech profiling, ensure fairness in automated decisions, preserve constitutionality, enhance individual control of personal information, and protect people from inaccurate data. These principles represent the first time the national civil and human rights organizations have spoken publicly about the importance of privacy and big data for communities of color, women, and other historically disadvantaged groups. Through these principles, we and the other signatory organizations highlight the growing need to protect and strengthen key civil rights protections in the face of technological change. Today, discrimination is not just a product of biased human decision making. Rather, as the Obama White House noted at the conclusion of its review on big data, discrimination can result from the way big data technologies are structured and used. The data we have reflects our history which is in part a history of systemic unfairness towards some consumers in the consumer credit marketplace and systemic economic exclusion in the broader economy overall. Whether big or small, more data and more kinds of data will play an even bigger role in the future of lending. Some of this data may help more Americans join the financial mainstream, helping to identify where individuals in protected status groups aren't enjoying the same access to credit as similarly, uh, similarly qualified non-minority borrowers. So while I am hopeful that more uses of big data will unlock new benefits, I am also concerned about its risk. The same is true with smaller alternative data sets. The benefits of adding rental and utility data to credit reports on credit scores for some consumers must be weighed against this risk, as my colleagues at the National Consumer Law Center explains today. But one thing is very clear. As we move forward to understand the implications of automated decision making on financial opportunity, we are grateful the CFPB, an effective independent agency that has had the best interests of consumers at its core mission, is on the job. The area of big data is one in which we particularly need rigorous oversight and standard setting in the public interest. Otherwise, the corporate users of data will have all the information and members of the public will have no way to see the big picture. This is just one more reason we think it's important that the CAPB keep on the path of its, of its independence and rigor intact. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So now moving to my left, Michael Gardner from Equifax. 
David, thank you. And thank you for uh, having uh, us as a part of this panel. Um, Equifax is obviously inextricably linked to the credit report as, as we have uh, traditionally defined it. Uh, and we take that responsibility very seriously. But we have also been in the game of what we call additional data. Here we call it alternative data, right? Which is what, what additional data can uh, be found in the marketplace that can be used to predict a consumer's credit worthiness. And, and that, that interest in additional data or alternative data goes back uh, really almost 15 years for Equifax. Um, and we believe that that alternative data benefits both consumers and the financial system. And we approach uh, how we use that data looking through both of those lenses. Um, uh, one of the other things that is perhaps a bit beyond the scope of this particular hearing, but I, I would like to get it out there, is uh, we also look at how alternative or additional data can be used in use cases prior to getting to the financial risk decision that a lender might make. And, and facilitating those decisions that get to that credit risk decision are equally as important to, to consumers as the final credit risk decision. If I, if I can't be identified appropriately, et cetera, then I'm not even going to get to the point of having a risk decision made. Uh, we we uh, at Equifax are also known uh, bec uh, for uh, housing the National Consumer Telephone and Utility Exchange Database. Uh, that is a voluntary database uh, that includes uh, utility, telecommunications, pay TV, and additional uh, 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 data for consumers. That database now approaches 215 million consumers. Uh, at any given time, uh, that database has somewhere between 25 and 30 million consumers in it uh, that we do not find present on our credit file, so correlating uh, very closely, Director Cordray, to the numbers you, you mentioned in your comments. Uh, so, so we leverage this data and other additional data along with the traditional credit data uh, uh, in models that we use or, or that we sell, obviously, and that our customers, financial institutions, and others use in the marketplace to assess credit worthiness. Uh, those models and new modeling techniques are, are a big part of how you leverage this data. Other panelists have mentioned that some alternative data uh, does not have the same coverage, uh, and therefore you have to uh, identify modeling techniques that, that overcome that coverage issue. Uh, the most notable uh, one of those solutions that is in the market today uh, is our FICO XD solution, where we partnered with FICO as the modeling arm. We leverage the NCTUE data and traditional credit data, uh, and we also leverage public record data sourced from LexisNexis risk solutions. So a, a lot of alternative data going into a single credit score, with the purpose of that score being specifically targeted to allow uh, non-scorable consumer, consumers on a traditional credit risk score to be scored by the credit card industry. And we do all of this uh, with, with a very, very strong focus on maintaining the same types of consumer protections for the, any data that is used in a risk decision that we apply to the core credit data. Thank you. Thank you. Nip and goal. I'm not sure which. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about a subject that is truly near and dear to our hearts over at Cabbage. Um, just to give you a quick overview of what we do, we are a tech and data platform, or if you will, a fintech company um, that's focused on delivering credit to small businesses all over the U.S. And so while we're not squarely in the consumer space, I think where we are squarely focused is leveraging alternative data to broaden access and break down barriers to traditionally underserved markets. Um, right before we got on stage, I took a quick look, and in the state of West Virginia, to date we've delivered $7 million in capital to over 200 small businesses. Um, and so our company was founded sort of on this question and notion of how do we use e-commerce seller data to provide loans to businesses selling on e-commerce platforms. And that sort of notion has been what's truly been the foundation of our growth and trajectory over the last few years. And so for the purpose of this discussion, I'd like to offer some, some of the guideposts that we've used as we've sort of looked for alternative data sources and have served both us as well as our customers pretty well. The first being, we look to leverage data sources that our, that our small business, again, caveating that we operate in the small business space, we, we try to look for data sources that our customers are already familiar with. Some examples here include connect your QuickBooks account, if that's what you use to manage your accounting. 
If you use Stripe to process payments, we look to use that sort of data. And so what that does for us, right, is it gives us a very in-depth and real-time understanding of the financial and operating health of a company. What it does for the consumer themselves, it actually engages them in a more in-depth and sort of engaged experience with the lending process and really gives them a stronger voice in the lending process itself. The second guidepost I'd sort of throw out there is one around transparency and reinforcing the use of how we're using that data. And so that's not to the level of sort of breaking down the machine learning, machine learning algorithms and narrowing out every single feature, but really trying to understand for our customers, for example, using financial accounts to understand cash flows, or if they are a seller on an e-commerce platform, using that to understand sales activity and getting, a, again, a more in-depth picture of what we can use to deem credit worthiness. So if borrowers understand how we're, understand the alternative data source and how we're using it, and we as financial service providers are both transparent in our use and extremely rigorous in our diligence, as I think a few folks here have mentioned, what we enable is just a more informed, straightforward lending process. In summary, what we're, whether we're using alternative data um, as a single model or embedding it on top of existing credit features, what I want to highlight is not striving just for transparency, but effective engagement of the customer in the process as well. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Francis Creighton from the Financial Services Roundtable. Thank you very much for having me here this morning, all of you from the CFPB, especially Director Cordray. I work at the Financial Services Roundtable, a trade association of about 100 of the 150 largest financial services companies in the country, uh, including banks, insurance companies, payments companies, investment firms, and others. This is a really exciting issue for us, and it's exciting because there's so much innovation and good thinking going on here. And that innovation should help more people get access to the kinds of financial services products that they need from the regulated lending community. First, let me note that financial institutions are both furnishers of information and consumers of that information. And I'm here today to talk uh, mainly about how financial institutions use the information that they obtain from others to make lending and other financial decisions. Now, financial institutions use data, data and information to assess how people have handled their bills in the past because that can be predictive of how they might handle their bills in the future. We use this information to judge whether a potential customer will be able to meet their future obligations. So from that perspective, the more information, the better. Having more information gives us a better ability to determine whether we should make a loan or not. We welcome more data and are working with our partners in the consumer data industry to get more because it helps us better serve our customers, both current and prospective. However, we need to make sure that the data we're using for lending decisions are fair, accurate, and verifiable, and that consumers have the ability to dispute information that they believe is inaccurate. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is a strong legal protector of fairness, security, accuracy, and data integrity. But given that more data is more helpful, we should also remember that we get data through a system where furnishers voluntarily provide the information and consumers of information voluntarily use it. Individual credit bureaus work hard to improve their data offerings, and that innovation and competition among them makes the process better. Therefore, we would be very concerned about any efforts to mandate what data we could and could not use. Further, what makes our system strong uh, is that when we use data, we have access to both positive information and negative information about a consumer's payment history. Both types of data play a role in assessing a consumer's situation, and limiting the type of data we can use we think would be counterproductive. We need both sides of the coin. We also want to note that as new data become available, we have to examine the implications of that data, not only on its predictiveness, but also for implications on fair lending and other regulatory grounds. For example, if some new data were more available for urban rather than rural families, that could result in thinner files for rural dwellers with the attendant impacts that could have on underwriting decisions impacting them. As the Bureau examines the implications of using new types of data, we just ask that these potential unintended consequences be kept in mind. Finally, I'd like to just note that data are used for reasons beyond whether we should grant credit. For example, our members may use data not covered by FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, 
including some forms of alternative data, these new kinds of data that some of you have referenced, for purposes like fraud protection, identity resolution, and verification. Using data for lending and other FCRA-covered purposes should not be conflated with data that may be used for these non-FCRA purposes. Again, thank you all very much for having me at this hearing. I look forward to working with the CFPB, our colleagues in industry and in the advocacy community, uh, to get this right. Uh, because if we do, we'll be able to help more of those people that the director referenced in his earlier statement. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the panelists for their thoughtful remarks. Uh, we now have Gail, Kale, and I now have an opportunity to engage in some Q&A and try to engender some interesting dialogue. Uh, I'll ask the first question, and I'll ask it of you, Francis, if I may. Uh, so what effect do you think alternative data will have on the 26 million credit invisible Americans and the 19 million who don't have enough data in their credit files to have a credit score under the commonly used scoring models? What effect will alternative data have on those? And also, what effect will it have on those with existing credit profiles? So I know we're far from Washington, but I'll give you a typically Washington phrase first. Uh, it depends. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's a really important point, because the strength of our system is that we look at people's individual situations. So those 45 million people that you're referring to, the 300,000 people here, what, what is their individual circumstance uh, show? We would probably be able to serve more people as a result of that. But what we don't know until we really do some research and have some historical data and everything else is what are the implications of who we serve and therefore who we don't serve on fair lending and other questions. And my members would be very unlikely to use information until they really can understand that. Uh, because while they think that they're doing everything correctly and according to the law when they make the decision, we know from past experience uh, with the Bureau and other agencies that making the decision right on an individual basis in the past won't necessarily be viewed when you look at the book of business in aggregate at some point in the future. So we want to be very careful of that and, and we really owe that to our uh, fair lending and other regulatory uh, obligations that we do so. Kale? So I think that's an enormously important question. Um, by no fault of the Bureau, alternative data is an enormously broad term. And I kind of want to make a binary distinction about what we're talking about. On one hand, we've heard things like utility, rental, telecom bill, payment-related behavior. We heard Cabbage talk about payment-related behavior for businesses on e-commerce platforms. That's something that I've just started calling mainstream alternative data. And I say mainstream because this is the kinds of data that the system and regulators are used to seeing. How have you paid your bills? What does your cash flow look like? And I want to hold that in one hand as something that I have some cautious optimism about with the giant asterisk of all the things that Chi Chi said in her opening statement about making sure that consumer protection laws with related to utility companies are respected at the state level, making sure that people aren't otherwise coerced with these even these basic data sources. But I, I just want to like call that mainstream alternative data, how you pay your bills. And I think we have a better sense of how to deal with that. Some of the big credit scoring models are already ready to consider that. We know how that works. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is probably the stuff you read about in the media a lot more, which is the, the social media data, the web data, the quote unquote big data. And that's an entirely different ballgame, an entirely different ballgame. No one knows. I don't think I can find a data scientist in the world that is ready to come and sit here and say, if you throw Facebook data into a, a consumer credit profile and make a credit score off of that, that we have any idea how to make sure that that's in any way, shape, or form fair. <laughs> that isn't, it isn't proxying for race, that it isn't, that you know, there's actually some explainable relationship between who your friend network is and how credit worthy someone thinks you is. We're not even close to being ready, in my opinion, to throw social network data into the mix. And I don't think that anyone sitting up here would disagree with that. Um, but I just want to point that out because sometimes the, the specter of social media data, of all the big marketing data on the internet, is kind of the tail that wags the dog of this discussion in a way that I think distracts us from the potentially more kind of sober and concrete um, near-term steps. And I just want to point out that um, I think it was early last year, Facebook, many of you are probably on Facebook, put a policy into place that prohibits any 
outside party using Facebook data to make eligibility decisions. And that includes credit and all the other FCRA covered purposes. So you have at least in Facebook's judgment for whatever purpose, for whatever, for whatever their internal reasons are, which I don't know, but no one should be using Facebook data to make these decisions. And so if you see startup companies claiming to do so, um, think twice before investing. Um, and the very last point I just want to make here is that one concern that many of us have on the advocacy side of the table is even when you're in that comparatively safer territory of bill repayment behavior that we others understand, I still pause because even when that goes into the FCRA regulated framework, um, that still means that whether or not I pay my cell phone bill or my utility bill is something that could be visible and used by my employer. And that's not the topic of today's conversation, but there's this kind of shadow of non-credit uses that gets cast across all of this that deserves some thought. And David, I believe my microphone wasn't on when I asked the question, so I'm just gonna restate it for the record. Um, the question was, how do you define alternative data as it is used in the credit process, and what is the impact that alternative data has had and could have on consumers? Thanks. You're not gonna restate your answer, right? <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> Gail. Either. Thank you. you. Uh, Michael Gardner, my question is for you. What data quality standards for issues such as accuracy, review, correction, should companies supplying alternative data and companies using alternative data be utilizing? Great. Uh, thank you for that, that, that question, Gail. Um, at Equifax, we take the approach that any data that will be used in any FCRA-regulated decision should meet very, very similar data standards. I intentionally did not say exact because the source of the data and the data elements in there are not going to be consistent, right? So uh, that starts with working with our furnisher community, right? Those that, that voluntarily provide the data, making sure they understand the data that we would uh, want them to be providing on a consistent basis and giving them the feedback when that data is not provided in an appropriate format. Uh, then you, we look internally at Equifax itself, and then how do we manage our data, right? Uh, how do we make sure that the data is appropriately refreshed? How do we make sure the data that is stale is removed? How do we make sure all of the legal requirements uh, for FCRA are met on each of our FCRA-regulated databases? Then internally, you also have to look at use case assessment for how that data will be used, right? Uh, that's both in building our own products, and I, th I think Aaron just kind of alluded to potentially how that data might be used as raw data uh, out in, uh, in, in the uh, marketplace. Uh, and we, we manage that in multiple ways. Uh, most notably, uh, the, we do not commingle alternative data, so the NCTUE database as an example, with the core credit file. Uh, so those are distinct databases, and any time that data will be commingled in a solution, that goes through extensive internal review. And then lastly, we make sure that any data that is used in an FCRA uh, use case uh, can be uh, properly disclosed to the consumer uh, and can be appropriately disputed by the consumer. Uh, and so we, we, we make sure that those CRAs are managed under the FCRA. So thank you. Thank you. Amanda. Uh, what consumer protection should be considered when alternative data is incorporated into predictive credit scoring modeling techniques? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. So the CFPB already has two tools in its authority, uh, the ACOA or uh, more DC speak here acronyms, <laughs> but the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And adding a third, it's authority to oversee and examine banks. And I think that that's critical for ensuring that the Bureau leveraged that authority to ensure that banks aren't, or see what the secret of the sauce is, to see what people are developing with the algorithms, uh, to see how uh, various consumers perhaps are targeted or factored into those algorithms. Uh, lastly, I think uh, the CFPB should ensure that all companies are um, marketing their products as as they should be marketed and aren't using them to promote financial opportunity uh, through misleading norms. Uh, I think the Bureau should make sure that all aspects of marketing comply with the FCRA, the ACOA, uh, and also make sure that uh, various data aggregators aren't tapping into or trying to avoid the FCRA by lumping in data based on you know myself with um, a neighbor or others in my community just making sure that there's accuracy and privacy as it re with respect to the FCRA. Thank you. Kale. 
Wait, wait. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, this question is for Nipun Gol. What role do you think alternative data has in responsible consumer financial innovation? What are the key factors to ensure that use is responsible? Thanks for that question. I think the role of alternative data in responsible consumer financial innovation is finding more ways to responsibly say yes, right? And whether that's to open access to folks who have credit thin files or credit invisible files, or to just make a more informed decision on a standard credit file, what I think alternative data does, and I think Francis, you alluded to this as well, is to understand the nuances that exist in a financial situation that inherently exists for all consumers and as we see for small businesses. And that's what alternative data and some of the, the other sort of buzzwords you hear around these types of things like machine learning and random forest algorithms, et cetera. I think what it really does and sort of what one of the sort of comments we always make is it gives you sort of information about not just the data points themselves, but what's going on between those data points and understanding the, the nuances of those financial situations. As we all know, credit decisions aren't black and white, and I think what the alternative data opportunity lies is around sort of helping reveal some of that gray and being able to penetrate some of those underserved and underrepresented areas. In terms of from a, from a you, key factors to ensure responsible use, I'll sort of start top down. I think, Michael, you mentioned a lot of the stuff around accuracy and veracity of the data furnishers. I think we, and sort of uh, Aaron, as you mentioned, one of the pieces as we're responsible for as a financial institution or financial service provider is really being rigorous in our diligence before even using a single data point in a credit decision. It's very easy for us to onboard a data source and start pulling that information. Like you mentioned, you'll see marketing campaigns all over the place saying, we're doing this, we're doing that. That part's the easy part. The developing and researching takes millions upon millions of data points and thousands of different model builds before you see a single, even single feature used in that. So it's really around just driving more diligence and rigorous analysis in that, what is still a murky process. But I think doing those two things together, um, just really, and the last piece being just engaging the customer in the process itself. One of the big opportunities we see is that this does give more control back to the consumer or the end customer as it's involved in that lending process. So if we can get all of those things together, I think it drives again a more informed and a better lending experience. Thanks. Thank you. Gail. Chi Chi Wu, my question is for you. How should companies using alternative data take into account fair lending considerations? Uh, thank you, Gail, for that question, and, and it's a very important one, obviously. Um, if alternative data is being used to underwrite credit decisions, it is subject to the ECOA, and as you know, the ECOA doesn't just prohibit intentional discrimination, um, it prohibits disparate impact, and it doesn't just apply to banks or financial institutions, it applies to all lenders and even some forms of small business credit. Um, and the disparate impact test is whether something um, has, a, 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 whether a policy has, uh, creates disparities for a protected class, race, gender, national origin, et cetera. Um, one of the important things to note is that um, credit scoring itself actually has a disparate impact. There are many, many, many studies that show that as a group, uh, certain minority groups have lower credit scores. And the reason shouldn't be surprising. It's what Amanda ta talked about. Um, credit scores are a uh, reflection and a measurement, and one of the things they measure is um, the disparities in economic health of minority communities, which has been impacted by 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and legalized discri uh, economic discrimination. And that has an impact on these communities. That's why you have the racial wealth gap where African Americans have seven cents on the dollar in assets for, to white families and Latinos have eight cents on the dollar. And that makes a big difference in paying your bills because you have a financial crisis um, someone with $100,000 in financial assets, which is your average, average white family, will be able to overcome it and pay their bills a lot better than someone with $7,000 in assets. So, you know, credit scores, and, and so the thing is, credit scores aren't the only thing that are gonna, is going to reflect those historical inequities. A, a lot of data sources will reflect that. If you have trouble paying your credit card, you're going to have trouble paying your cell phone bill. Um, 
and you know, there's this concept Amanda alluded to, structural racism, where you know the the very institutions and systems in our society carry forward that racism, not because of any animus, although unfortunately we've seen a lot of that recently, not because of any animus, but because systems replicate themselves. And so um, it'll get reflected in the data. So um, is this hopeless? No, I mean, credit scoring is legally used for credit, and that's because the, the ECOA test is a three-part test, and the second part is whether there's a legitimate business justification for a policy that creates a disparate impact. And for credit scoring, the justification is it's proven to be predictive. It's empirically sound, statistically derived. There's actually a test in Regulation B. And so any alternative data um, source is going to have to pass that same sort of rigorous level of being proven to be predictive and empirically derived and statistically sound. And by the way, there is a third part, is there a less discriminatory alternative, which we don't really focus on as much, and, and there should be more focus. Is there a way to get rid of this disparate impact? And really, that's the brass ring here for alternative data and any data. Can you find the data source that doesn't have this structural um, racism baked in? That's, I think, what we should be looking for. Um, I, I think, Director Cordia, you had a great point in talking about you know, looking at data that's forward-looking and not so much a measurement of the past. Um, I, I think that, um, because the past is infused with this uh, historical discrimination. Thank you. So let me ask one final question for all the panelists, which is really a summary kind of wrap-up kind of question. Uh, and ask you for any additional thoughts you want to add as to some of the benefits and the risks uh, that using alternative data uh, has in the credit decision process. And we'll just go in reverse order from when we started. So we'll start with you, Francis, and go down the line this way. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, just to sum up, I think what I would say is that the possibility of alternative data should be looked into two different areas, the kind of traditional uh, pieces, the way Adam, Aaron described it, and the more innovative pieces. On the more traditional pieces, we have to have a better understanding of what the long-term impacts are going to be in fair lending and other areas before we'll use it. We have obligations under the law, and we want to follow those obligations. That competes with this idea that we want to serve more people. We want to get the unbanked into the system, and those are a tension, and we have to resolve that tension together if we're going to make this worthwhile. 45 million people is both a a problem for our society that we're not serving them, and it's also an opportunity that we can go out and, and, and help those people get the financial services products that we need. We have to overcome that struggle, though. Yeah, I would sort of echo a lot of the same points, and I'll go back to, I still think, at its simplest, it's being able to provide consumers and other end customers with a voice that in the lending process that, typically, that traditionally has not existed there before. From a risk side, again, as I mentioned, just ensuring the rigorous analysis and diligence that's needed when onboarding a new data source or continuing to assess and regulate existing data sources that are in the market now. Thank you. Michael. Michael. Thank you. Uh, so uh, benefits, I, th I think, have been well stated by my colleagues here. I, I won't reiterate those. I think that one of the risks that we need to be vigilant uh, about, beyond, beyond the ones that have been uh, brought forward already, is this idea of really understanding the long-term impacts of leveraging uh, new alternative data in any decision. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier in my comments that, that we have the privilege of uh, access to the NCTUE database at Equifax. Uh, we have had that data and have been modeling that data for over 10 years uh, and really only in the last couple of years moved that data into solutions that are in the marketplace, in part because we want to understand those longer term impacts. We want to understand how a consumer who is present in the NCTUE data file becomes present in the credit file and understanding that consumer journey. Journey and, and being able to facilitate that. So, so that, that's one risk I think we need to be vigilant about is, is understanding longer term impacts because as, as Nippon said, getting the data and throwing it into an algorithm is easy. We all have great IT departments that can crunch the numbers for us, right? But it's really understanding the impacts there. Uh, and, you know, and we as a, as a, a NCRA <laughs> have, have sort of a dual obligation, right? Because we need to be able to educate our end customers, financial institutions, and others on appropriate ways to use the data. And of course, we, we have our own FCRA requirements. So thank you. Amanda. 
So the CFPB should be commended for its two reports in the credit marketplace. Uh, and one which has been referenced here today via the director's remarks and by some of us on the panel on credit invisibles. And if I could, I'll just read a line from that report, which also the director um, cited as well in his opening remarks. In 2015, we published a report finding that 26 million Americans are credit invisible. This figure indicates that one in every 10 adults does not have any credit history with one of the three nationwide credit reporting companies. The report also found that black and Hispanic consumers and consumers in low income neighborhoods are more likely to have no credit history or not enough current credit history to produce a credit score. Clearly the pr primary benefit of alternative data if works as promised would be to raise credit scores of credit invisibles and open up a financial opportunity. But if alternative data is implemented unfairly or inappropriately, it could harm the consumer. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? So I just want to, to pick up and highlight a few threads of conversation in closing. Uh, the first is what Chi Chi just said about even today's credit scoring system kind of baking in. Um, uncomfortable gaps in wealth and privilege in our society. I think that's a really important place to start. Um, that's tolerable as a matter of policy for a lot of the reasons you mentioned, but I think it's just important to keep in mind that that's the foundation we're building from. And even if you just take the easier data sets like bill repayment behavior that we understand and throw it into the mix, that doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily immediately going to help the 45 million people that don't have good visibility of the system. And so I think we need to be really thoughtful about how we do that. Again, the touchstone is what helps the people we're trying to help. Um, and this is a situation in which I think some careful additions of new data could be really useful. Um, but it's certainly not the case that more is better. More data doesn't equal more innovation in a helpful way. Like I said, there's a whole spectrum of stuff that people are talking about um, that's just all smoke and no fire. You know, anytime someone talks about social media data or web browsing behavior or your Amazon shopping behavior going into credit scores, please hold that separately. Um, that's a whole separate world. Um, I think it's an interesting question of if we bring new data into the formal credit reporting infrastructure, whether or not it's possible for there to be an industry standard of holding that data separate for credit decisions. Um, I think that there's been a lot of um, talk about how all this data is studied really, really carefully before it's applied to these decisions. I think that if we're going to bring new data into the conversation, it makes sense to say, let's start by using this for credit decisions, and maybe we're not ready for employment rental applications and insurance yet. And I think that would provide some comfort to at least me personally. Um, and the final point I want to make is there's been discussion about making algorithms transparent and being able to audit algorithms. The easiest way to get your arms around what an automated decision, automated decision making system is doing is understanding the data that's going into it and what you're trying to measure. And there does become a point where the complexity gets so high or the data becomes so tangential that it becomes really, really hard to ask rational questions of that system, which is I think another reason to just take this slow one step at a time. Thank you. And Chi-Chi, you get the last word. Oh, cool. Thank you, David. Um, so I want to actually take a step back from the question. Um, you know, the question is risks and benefits to credit decisions. I want to talk about the credit itself, because I think it's really important. We have been talking about expanding access to credit without qualifying what kind of credit. Um, and it's, I think, really important to remember we want the credit to be affordable. Um, some of the fintech lenders, not anybody at this table, but some of the ones we've seen, have triple digit APRs. And, and, and really, I'm not sure that's going to benefit anyone, right? Um, and also, you know, even affordable credit, you want to make sure the consumer can afford that credit. Um, you know, let's go back in the Wayback Machine, 10, 15 years ago, or early 2000s, mid 2000s. Credit, there was lots of access to credit. Um, you know, people could get credit without, you know, stating their income or their assets. And uh, when we, you know, when we consumer advocates say, "Hey, this is not a good thing," we were told we were against the democratization of credit, and that was, you know, we, how dare we be against democracy itself? And well, we know how that story ended, right? So the touchstone for credit should always be ability to repay. And you know, creating al you know, alternative data cr um, to create a credit score, um, whether it's a traditional alternative credit score, um, it, that's 
only one part of the equation. The other is, you know, you, the consumer has to be able to afford that credit. Um, and you know, one of the interesting th things about some of the, some of the data sources we're talking about is it might be able to incorporate that. I mean, uh, Director Cordray, you mentioned bank account information, and uh, you know that incorporates both payment data but also income data. So there might be some. Uh, and and uh, Nipun Gold, you know, mentioned the cash flow. Um, Cash flow obviously is important to repay credit obligations. Now, um, you know that's why it's great that the the bureau has taken um, this interest in you know letting consumers um, use third party aggregators because I'm not sure it's a great idea um, always to have lenders looking directly at the transaction level data because there could be some privacy concerns over there. So you know having some sort of intermediary to protect the privacy of consumers, also to give them control so that they can opt in and decide to do this or not to do this is important. Um, and, and finally, um, I, I think if we're going to use things like bank account data, we really do have to deal with the overdraft issue. Um, so, um, but I think it, you know, that, that there is a potential there and, um, you know, certainly I think s having six months or a year of bank account data is probably more useful information than in a three-year-old collection account for medical debt um, where you disputed with the provider over the copay. Thank you. So this concludes the panel portion of our program and I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking all of our panelists for a thoughtful discussion. And let me now invite the panelists to retake their seats and turn the program back over to Zixta Martinez, our Associate Director for External Affairs, who will moderate the next portion of the field hearing. Thank you, David. And again, thank you to the panel of experts. An important part of how the Bureau helps consumer finance markets work is to hear directly from consumers, from industry, from state and local partners, and of course, from community advocates across the U.S. One of the ways that we gather public feedback is through events like these. We've held field hearings, town halls, and other public events across the U.S. from Miami, Florida, to Itabina, Mississippi, to Seattle, Washington. And at these events, we not only hear from experts in the field, we also invite the public to participate. Uh, but before I open the floor up for public comments, I want to remind folks that there are several other ways to communicate your observations, your concerns, or complaints to the CFPB. You can submit a consumer complaint with the CFPB through our website at consumerfinance.gov. Our website will walk you through that process. Or you can call 1-855-411-2372. We take complaints about mortgages, car loans or leases, payday loans, student loans or other consumer loans. We also take complaints about credit cards, prepaid cards, credit reporting, debt collections, money transfers, bank accounts and services, and other financial services. If you don't have a specific complaint, but would like to share your story with us, we have a feature on our website called Tell Your Story, where you can tell us your story, good or bad, about your experience with consumer financial products or services. Your story will help inform the work that we do to protect consumers and create a fairer marketplace. We have another feature called Ask CFPB, where you can find answers to over a thousand frequently asked questions about consumer financial issues, as well as additional resources. We also have a Spanish language website called CFPB en Español, where you can find answers to consumers' frequently asked questions and additional consumer resources. So I encourage you to visit consumerfinance.gov to learn more about the resources and tools the Bureau has developed to help consumers make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. So now it's time to hear from members of the public that are here today. A number of you signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion. The public comment portion of the field hearing is also an important opportunity for the Bureau to hear about what's happening in consumer finance markets in your community. Uh, what we hear from you is invaluable. We'd like everyone who signed up to be able to speak, so we encourage you to um, take about two minutes to share your thoughts and observations with us. And I will call our first public commenter, and that is Jonathan Marshall, P. 
Peter will bring you a microphone. Okay. That's actually it's a little higher. Um, so my name is Jonathan Marshall. I'm a uh, consumer rights lawyer here in, in West Virginia in Charleston. And, uh, you know, I found this, this discussion uh, pretty interesting. Um, you know, kind of my role over the last couple of years, at least here, has been um, down to the legislature. We've faced some pretty unprecedented attacks on um, existing debt collection regulations that have been in place for many, many, many years here. And over the last couple of years, we've been able to work with industry, uh, work with banks to um, come to reasonable compromises. But unfortunately, again this year, um, folks are back again and asking for more. Um, as I see what the, the, the CFPB is trying to do with respect to alternative credit is, I understand the need for the availability of credit, uh, and that's important. But I think that that needs to be balanced with existing um, both federal and state debt collection protections. Um, I think the last uh, panelist or last commenter, uh, commentator here talked about it's not just about um, alternative data and you have to look at those three C's, right? It's capacity too, right? It's, it's, it's character and it's collateral. And uh, I would hope that the CFPB as it moves forward in this area does keep in mind uh, those important consumer um, protections that exist both at a federal level and at a state level. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Sam Valendingham. Okay. All right. Uh, Patrick Walker. Thank you. Um, just a few comments. Um, I'd like to uh, underscore the need for alternative data and new, new uh, solutions. Um, it was alluded to a little bit, but um, I think that the numbers are, are, are stark. From uh, the CFPB's own uh, data point on credit invisibility, while the overall rate of uh, unscorability was 19% nationwide, in the lowest income census tracts, it's 45%. So it's not kind of a small or mi minor problem in some parts of the country. It's actually a very large issue. Um, and so I'd just like to point that out to, um, to note that the status quo um, has some very important gaps that we definitely need new solutions. Um, secondly, um, PERC has done some uh, of our own research where we looked at the uh, lowest income census tracts and what we find is that when you do add in the alternative data that the 30, 35, 40 percent rates of unscorability falls greatly. Um, depending on what score you use and what solutions, it can, it can fall as low as a few percentage points. Um, and, um, and those individuals are not just coming into the system with subprime scores, they're coming in, in many cases, with um, prime scores, <clears throat> 620s or above. Um, I, I'd also like to comment on um, one of the notes that um, we need to uh, look at the longer term impacts of this data. And of course, it is completely the case that we need to be prudent um, with, with new data and n new solutions. Um, I would like to uh, point out, though, that um, there have been a number of utilities that have re been reporting to the CRAs for decades now. So the data is out there. Um, we, we don't need to have an experiment that will go into the future for many, many years and, and then look at the outcomes. Um, we actually have individuals that were new to the credit system with alternative data back in the late 90s, in the early 2000s. So you, you could actually look at the, those individuals. Um, PERC has done a little bit of that work um, and we, we didn't find any decrease in credit scores after individuals um, access credit from alternative data. In fact, we found um, score increases over time, similar to a, a control group. So um, if, if that is an area of concern um, that need not hold up um, the transition to new solutions, we, we can look at data that's already been reported for years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Chris Arthur. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to come to the great state of West Virginia. My name is Chris Arthur. I'm general counsel for the West Virginia Division of Financial Institutions. Um, I see benefits and I also see concerns regarding the use of alternative data. In particular, I'm worried about discriminatory practices and how massive this information may be. I even think something like utility, not utility bills, but cable bills or telephone bills is something very concerning to me because a lot of people look at that as not, it's not a must, it's a luxury. 
and I know one people that live close to me that they may not pay their phone bill because they would rather use that money to do something for their children. But the rest of their credit, they pay their rent, they pay their other bills, but that's a decision. They may do the exact same thing with a cable bill. They may have something that they find more important, so they'll miss their cable. And I could see that being more of a detriment and a negative to people who are really trying to build a good credit. The other thing, let's face it, technology is really moving fast. And the amount of data that you can get, especially like Facebook or social media, I can see a lot of discriminatory practices. So I think we have to weigh this and limit its use and make sure that we make good decisions what alternative data is useful to build credit versus alternative data that may be used in a very negative way, including a discriminatory practice. The state of West Virginia is very poor and there are a lot of poor people, and a lot of poor people work very hard. But like I mentioned, they make decisions based on what's in the best interest of their children and their family. And some of the things that were discussed today may be a detriment to them building credit. But again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. Bren Pomponio. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to first uh, express our appreciation for um, uh, the work that the Bureau has done uh, in protecting consumers. Uh, I work at a nonprofit uh, legal service organization, and many of our clients uh, have seen the benefits of the Bureau's actions, whether it be consent decrees that give them new rights and, uh, and uh, uh, enforcement actions that, that show uh, tangible benefits to them in terms of returning money. Um, and so we're, we're thankful for the work that the Bureau does. Uh, I, my comments on the alternative data issue uh, uh, come from uh, representing uh, low-income West Virginia consumers for, for more than 15 years um, in a variety of contexts. And West Virginia has the highest incident of home ownership in the country but is also one of the lowest um, uh, uh, states in terms of economic uh, and poverty. And so at this intersection of uh, high home ownership incidents and socio low socioeconomic incidents is uh, fertile ground for predatory lenders in the past. And um, I'd like to hope that when considering the uh, alternative data that that uh, make sure that the safeguards are in place that uh, doesn't allow in uh, alternative facts. Um, I, I'm thinking about going back to before 2008, uh, the no-doc loans, uh, where a lot of uh, West Virginians' income was falsely inflated because there wasn't sufficient safeguards in the underwriting process to ensure that uh, the uh, the, the information that was being used uh, uh, to make the credit decision was accurate. And this hurt people because it put them into, into loans that were secured by their home, uh, converted uh, unsecured credit to secured credit in which they couldn't pay because their income source was not sufficient to cover the monthly payments. So I would just ask that uh, the accuracy of that data uh, uh, be considered uh, when uh, the underwriting decisions are made. Thank you, Mr. Pompano. Margo Saunders. Hi. Um, as you know, I'm Margo Saunders with the National Consumer Law Center. Uh, I have seen a number of instances where the promise of the use of alternative data, particularly rent payments through one of these new rent uh, reporting pr agencies for rent, has been used as the premise for pulling people into very dangerous uh, predatory credit transactions. And I think we've seen it also with some payday loans. So I would just urge you to, um, while you investigate the viability of using alternative data to boost credit scores, that you ensure that you don't allow the, this vehicle of 
using alternative data to improve credit scores to be the means by which people are pulled into dangerous credit. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Linda Frame. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Linda Frame, and I work for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Um, we research economic policies to determine what can be done at both the state and federal level to give regular people in our communities a shot at a decent job that earns a decent wage and allows for a decent quality of life. I'd like to thank the CFPB for visiting Charleston today, and we are here to express our appreciation for its hard work and also the hard work of the Attorney General's Office here to protect our families, in particular from payday lenders. Today's field hearing is a great explanation and exploration of how to expand credit opportunities for people. Protecting those who are credit invisible, however, from payday lending is also a very important component of the CFPB's work. This, my organization is working with states across the nation where payday lending is illegal as it is here in West Virginia. Last year, Director Cordray may recall, we all gathered in DC to present him with a whole pile of cards, postcards, signatures, petitions from all of our states where we do not have payday lending. Um, all total, there are 90 million people in the United States who live in states where we do not have payday lending, and we hope that this can grow. Experience from our states, and well, the states that do have payday lending has shown that allowing payday lenders to do whatever they want does not benefit people. In fact, according to the Center for Responsible Lending, Keeping payday lenders out of West Virginia saves our residents $48 million every year in payday lending fees. This has helped our families from falling into the debt trap caused by payday loans. So thank you for allowing me to stray a little bit off topic to thank you all for coming to Charleston. And we hope you will continue your good work and in, in help us preserve West Virginia's strong tradition of consumer protection and banning payday lending here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frame. And thank you to all that provided thoughtful public testimony today. Thank you to the audience, to the panelists, and to all those watching via live stream at consumerfinance.gov. This concludes the CFPB's field hearing in Charleston, West Virginia. Have a great afternoon.